Good afternoon, everyone. Um, do what you can to stay awake. I know it's uh, post lunch. It's the post lunch hour. Everything we say, we want to use the word post as much as possible uh, for today's workshop. Let me open us up in a word of prayer. Lord, we are um, in this very interesting and sometimes painful, sometimes exciting opportunity for us personally as followers of Christ and as uh, members of the Church of Christ. And I sense that this is a really special um, time for the church, a time where we have uh, to follow you, lean into each other, and be open to all that you have for us in a unique way, in a historical way. So I pray that our time together would help facilitate that, catalyze that, and uh, help us to move further into your will and into your vision for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today we want to talk about the post-church church. The subtitle there says, Anticipating the post-Trump, post-Floyd, post-pandemic, post-Christendom renewal of the Christian church in America. I've had the opportunity and really the privilege and the luxury of spending the last year and a half researching reading everything I can find, going to all the conferences I can go to, that uh, just looking into what all has happened in the last few years. You know, what, what's happened in the world, but really more to our point today, uh, what's happening to the church and what's happening with the church. And um, I'm gonna just present some of my synthesis to you today. I don't think it's exhaustive. What I don't want to do is try to predict the future in any way. I don't think any of us know yet how this is all going to land. But um, I do kind of have a brain that keeps searching for sort of the unifying theory of the universe. And I'm mean, trying to understand like what's, what's really happening underneath it all. If you dig deep enough, maybe we can see how some of these disparate things are actually connected and symptomatic of a common thing. And so I want to present some of that today. Uh, let me start with a quote uh, from, I think it's the Audubon Society. It says this, during wildfires, by the way, that is a picture taken after a wildfire. Anybody know what kind of plant or flower that is? Uh, yeah, you got it. During wildfires, the nutrients from dead trees are returned to the soil. That's already a really big sentence. The forest floor is exposed to more sunlight. That's also a mouthful. Think about, I mean, as a church planner, I've always wanted to plant churches so that people have an actual opportunity to stumble on Christ. And my experience was that people never get to stumble on Christ or reject Christ or accept Christ because they keep stumbling on Christians along the way. And so this is kind of taking me there when I read that the forest floor is exposed to more sunlight, allowing seedlings released by the fire to sprout and grow. Many trees have evolved fire-resistant bark, like ponderosa pine or eucalyptus. Others, like the giant sequoia or lodgepole pine in Yellowstone National Park, require fire to open their waxy cones and release seeds. Fire also acts as a natural disinfectant, incinerating diseased plants and removing them from the flora population. Also, if you have sort of the church in, in the back of your mind and you read this as a metaphor, that's a huge statement as well. After fires, the charred remnants of burned trees provide habitats for insects and small wildlife. In a moist, post-fire climate, native plants will thrive. Sometimes post-wildfire landscapes will explode into thousands of flowers in the striking phenomenon known as super bloom. One of the beautiful things about California fires is spending time in those areas as soon as you start getting rains, Dr. Stevens Ruman says. There is an abundance of beautiful flowers and vegetation that you can only see after fire years. Again, 
really um, to the point when you think about the church. Uh, what are some feelings you get as I read this and as you kind of think about your own church context, what you've experienced, what you've observed, what you fear, what you hope for? Do you understand that we are living in a kind of post-fire opportunity for the church? That maybe, and this is I think my feeling, we are going to see a kind of super bloom for the church. I don't think I'm being overly optimistic. I think that's where we're headed. This, is, this has always been the desire of the Holy Spirit, the trajectory that He's been taking us on all these years. If you think about the church the way it was, the way it has been, is that really where you want it to stop? Like when you think about a church Sunday service, is that really an adequate representation of the Lord of the universe, God Almighty? Like reduced to that Sunday service and people come and they experience that tiny little thing and say, we call it good. Like let's just keep doing that forever. We know that that's not what we would say we want. But if we want something more, something better, something further along the road, how do we get there? Well, I think it takes a kind of forest fire to bring us there. There's certain seeds that can only be released by the fires that I think we've experienced. There had to be some kind of unmasking and revealing and forcing and all of that. We needed what we've experienced. They are not our enemies in the hands of the Holy Spirit who is doing a redeeming work. You know, we don't want to be grateful for pain, but we're grateful for the uh, fruit of pain, right? Um, John Piper, some of you may not have heard his name in a while, in 2006 was dealing with his own bout with cancer. And he wrote a post that later became a book. Uh, he wrote in, his, in this post in 2016, uh, 2006, Don't Waste Your Cancer. And I think uh, what is upon us, slide three, is a don't waste your pandemic moment for the church. So I'll make a, I don't know if this is confrontational or not, but if you are sitting here longing to return to the ways that the church used to be, you're gonna waste your pandemic. If you think that we should return and you're still sort of waiting for things to return to quote unquote normal, I think you're wasting your pandemic. Uh, Kerry Newhoff, he's been a really, I don't know, good sort of gathering point for all things leadership in the church for many years now, Canadian guy. And uh, he recently wrote, uh, this wonderful post, he said, they're not coming back. Stop waiting for people because they're not coming back. The people, and he goes on to say, start making plans with the people who've already come back and stop holding your breath for the ones who haven't come back. Anybody in here been waiting for the people to come back? Whoever has come back, that's it. Plus some new people that weren't there in the first place. So that's kind of the reality. Uh, some, for some of us, this will be reviewed, but so I'll go over it quickly. I think it's important for us to understand that we are in the midst of experiencing a paradigm shift in the church. Uh, the Kuhn cycle is a simple cycle of progress described by Thomas Kuhn in 1962 uh, in his seminal work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So basically what happened is prior to the Kuhn cycle, people believed that change happened in little increments. You know, progressive change, slow and steady change. But what he, I, in my opinion, proved, and I think this is true not just for the uh, science domain, for, but for personal change also, we don't just change a little bit at a time, but we change in huge bursts. They're sort of like, it's more like revolution rather than evolution. It happens like in big chunks at a time. And describing this uh, manner in which we experience change, he called, he introduced something called a paradigm shift. I wanna read some of this to you because I think uh, it's important that you understand and accept that the paradigm is shifting. 
And you're going to have to shift with it, or you're going to be left behind. You're going to miss the opportunity that the pandemic is providing for us. Science advanced the most by occasional revolutionary explosions of new knowledge. Each revolution triggered by introduction of new ways of thought so large they must be called new paradigms. What is a paradigm? We've used this word for many years. What is it actually? I didn't know until I read this. A paradigm is a comprehensive model, so that part we knew, of understanding that provides a field members, that's in this case that's Christians, with viewpoints and rules on how to look at the field's problems and how to solve them. So a paradigm presents us with answers to questions we have. It goes on to say that when we live in the paradigm long enough, we begin to have deeper questions. It's kind of like a relationship. It's all good the first couple of years. And then you start having what? Deeper questions. Why is he the way he is? My wife still, after 25 years of marriage, still squeezes the toothpaste from the middle. I don't understand. Right? So I have deeper questions. I didn't have that question year one or even year two, or even year three. We're, we're due for a paradigm shift in our bathroom <laughs> habits here. <laughs> but when you begin to live in the paradigm long enough, you have a different set of questions. That's just how it works. But the paradigm doesn't have answers to those deeper questions. And then you begin to feel increasing tension with regard to these unanswered questions. And then there's a, a, a cumulative effect of more and more people beginning to feel uncomfortable with the unanswered questions. <clears throat> Over time, the field digs so deep into its area of interest, it discovers new questions. We said that already. Um, as more of these anomalies or violations of ex expectations appear, the model grows weaker. This is called a model drift. And we've seen this over the years, different people exploring different ways of being a Christian. I remember reading years ago a book called A New Kind of Christian. Right? That's been happening. If enough unsolved anomalies appear and the model cannot be patched up to explain them, then the model crisis step is reached. You can argue whether we're there yet or not. In my opinion, it is there. Here the model is obviously no longer capable of solving the field's current problems of interest. I will present some categories of these problems to us later. If a crisis, uh, it is a crisis because decisions can no longer be made rationally. We're having to sort of do mental gymnastics to try to explain things. Out of the struggle to form a new model of understanding, one or more viable candidates emerge. This begins the model revolution step. For example, I remember years ago, Pastor Darren, is he in this room? He's not here. Uh, but he came to the Evangelical Covenant Church and wanted to start a brand new church that decentered the Sunday service. And we thought, what a fool. Who? Sunday is church. Right? I mean, what was he thinking? He was beginning to explore a new model. I mean, now, you can't, I can't walk 10 feet without somebody talking to me about what a scattered church model looks like. I mean, I interact with planters almost on a daily basis, and almost all of them have thought about it. What would it be like if I didn't have to be the rock star every Sunday? What if my job wasn't to be the hero, but the hero maker? What if I really leaned into the APES model and saw myself as an equipper rather than a doer? I mean, these, these questions are coming up on a daily basis almost because there's a kind of model crisis that they're ex experiencing, so they're beginning to experiment. Out of the struggle to form a new model of understanding, one or more viable candidates emerge. This begins the model revolution step. It's a revolution because the new model is a new paradigm. 
It's radically different from the old paradigm, so listen to this. So different, so different, the two are uh, incommensurate. Each uses its own rules to judge the other. Thus, believers in each paradigm cannot communicate well. This causes paradigm change resistance. But we keep going. Once a single new paradigm is settled down by a few influential supporters, the paradigm change step begins. Here the field transitions from the old to the new paradigm while improving the new paradigm to maturity. Eventually, the old paradigm is sufficiently replaced and becomes the field's new, quote unquote, normal science. Then the cycle begins all over again because our knowledge about the world is never complete. I want to ask you to raise your hand, so think about this question. Um, do you believe that there's a paradigm shift that we are in the midst of for the church here in America? Anybody say we're not there yet? We've got to return back to the way that things used to be. Does anybody feel like we have enough answers to the questions that the culture is asking of the church? Any grandparents in here? Are you able, are your grandkids old enough for you to have conversations with them about the world and about the faith? Do they think like you think? Do they like the church that you like? Do they want to practice spirituality the way you want to practice spirituality? Who's crazier? You, they in your eyes or you in their eyes? <laughs> Should you do church for your generation or for their generation? These are questions. Do they have the same values that you have? Are they threatened by the same things that you're threatened by? Are they anxious about the same things that you're anxious about? So I think we are, I think everybody either agreed or didn't vote on whether we are in a uh, paradigm shift or not. My personal belief is that we are undoubtedly in a paradigm shift. But in case you don't agree with me, slide five, uh, I think is pretty uh, telling. Slide five. Okay, so this is one of three charts I'm gonna show you today. This is a depiction of the declining median worship attendance among U.S. congregations from the year 2000 to the year 2020 before the pandemic. Okay? So the median church attendance in the U.S. was 137 in the year 2000. And you might remember Y2K? Right? The world did not end. It ended in 2020. <laughs> In the year 2020, the median attendance was what? 65. Anybody Asian enough to be good at math in here? <laughs> Actually, I scored higher on the verbal part of the SAT, so I should put my hand down. But I do know that 65 is less than half of 137. <laughs> if you presented this trajectory to any industry, they would panic. And yet the church just wants to go back to normal. There has never been a normal. We've been in decline for 20 years at least. Like, this is not an opinion. <laughs> it's not a matter of perspective. It's just reality. Do you know that Netflix, when they were first starting up, they went to Blockbuster and asked to be bought out by them. They asked if they can partner together. And you know what Blockbuster said? Who are you? Okay, one more chart here. Slide 16, slide six, excuse me. This, I don't love the way uh, the data is depicted in this. I'm gonna uh, summarize it for you. So this is August 2021 attendance as a percentage of January 2020 attendance. So this is comparing August 2021, which is not that long ago, to January 2020. 65% of churches, that's the far majority, are seeing 
50 to 90 percent less people coming to church. Most churches in America are seeing more than half of their people not coming back to church. And as of 2021, when this was this uh, chart stopped, um, it's been worse. I talked to, I didn't talk to every pastor obviously, but all of the pastors I talked to had a horrible post-Easter Sunday experience. They thought, this is so exciting on Easter Sunday. Our people are back. And even that was just a percentage of what they're used to. And then the Sunday after, oh, was it painful for you? Raise your hand if so. <laughs> yeah, right? Where did they go? What happened to them? <clears throat> so 65%, 65% of churches are seeing 50 to 90% less people. Only 9% of churches are seeing growth in 2021. And almost all of those churches are in the South. Because they didn't have a pandemic. <laughs> they didn't get the memo. Reach, reach. <laughs> I've been to Atlanta twice and Florida twice. They did not have a pandemic. My Uber driver was not wearing a mask. That means 91% of churches are seeing less in 2021 than they did in 2020. That's 91%. More than 9 out of 10 churches. And that's if you're alive still. Churches were decimated or divided or dead. Go to the next slide. There's a... What, I, what I've come to call the five functions of the pandemic. This is what the church did to us. Uh, slide seven. The first function is that the pandemic had a revealing effect. It showed the church what was weak, what was wrong, what was broken, what was insufficient, what was incompetent, what was completely nonsensical. It just stripped some of the uh, brush away, and we couldn't hide anymore. So it had a revealing effect on the church, right? Secondly, uh, the church, uh, the pandemic had an accelerating effect on the church. Whatever was already happening, it made it go even faster, right? So if there was a ministry that was struggling, like it died. It would have lasted maybe a few more years, but not during the pandemic. Yeah. If your giving was hard, it got even harder. Right? Uh, I mean, it wasn't all negative. Uh, if your relationships were tight and it was kind of a well-oiled machine, some of those churches did pretty well in the beginning. And lots of pastors reported, hey, we actually grew during the pandemic. But even those churches, most of them, you know, uh, started to decline. So that was only a short-lived phenomenon. Uh, third, there was a uh, forcing effect. It kind of forced the issue on some matters, right? Like we had to talk about race because it was like happening. Do you remember that? That was hard, right? Uh, some churches kind of went, some pastors went all in, and then the law of friction, equal and opposite force, just pushing back, right? So we really had to figure out what's happening, but we kind of didn't have a choice because it was being forced on us. A fourth effect that the pandemic had is that it had a flattening effect. Remember, the first thing that went away was a centralized model. We could not be a gathered church anymore. It wasn't about just one pastor and everybody sitting and staring at this pastor, hoping that the pastor has all of the goods that you need. But I mean, like starting from when the pastor was in often, often cases, the only literate person in the village, we've, we've retained this centralized model of how to do church. Even look at the way the seats are organized here. This, this is a discipleship program of this church right here. Everybody's looking at the one person. This is how it works in our churches, right? We're showing our cards here, what we really believe about discipleship. But the pandemic had a flattening effect. We had to have leaders in different regions, different parts, 
Where people lived, we needed leaders. We needed Zoom leaders and small group leaders and missional outreach leaders manning the different outposts that the church set up to help people during the pandemic or whatever you did, but it couldn't just be about you anymore. And so a bunch of pastors just felt a little bit, you know, confused and disoriented during the pandemic. Like, who am I if I'm not preaching? You know, and they felt silly preaching into a camera and their jokes, they weren't funny before. They really weren't funny when you had no audience or when everybody's muted or... <laughs> By flattening, I mean your jokes were flat. <laughs> And then finally, it had a focusing effect. It showed us what really mattered. It kind of gave us a little peek into what church is really about. It wasn't about the programs, it turns out. It wasn't about the greatness of the pastor's sermons. It turns out we, lay people knew that. Pastors didn't know that. <laughs> it was revealing and accelerating and forcing for the pastor to realize it wasn't all about their sermon. But it gave us some focus, some clarity, or beginning to, we're beginning to experience some of that clarity. Um, next slide. There were three other things that happened during the pandemic, and this was beyond the church, but definitely for the church as well. There was a kind of debunking that happened. There was also a kind of deep loading. And then finally, a kind of reckoning, making things right. Um, Debunking. You know, there were some like fluffy things about the church that just got called out. You know, there was some silliness, some goofiness, things that the church, you know, the traditional cultural stuff, it just seemed silly. Like you couldn't do it. Remember the early days of the pandemic? Like we tried to do this, we tried to replicate the exact same thing on Zoom, and it was just so silly. It was goofy, it didn't work. And so we just stopped it, you know? Uh, and then deep loading, people are, if you Google church giving trends, you're gonna be depressed. People are not giving like they used to. I mean, not just to the church, but to institutions in general. Do you know that one million less students applied to go to colleges last year? Because students are asking, could you remind us what we're paying for again? Like, because if it's information, I have access to all of it. Like for example, Wharton Business School, they realized this and they made 100% of their curriculum free online. If you want the content, it's free. What about networking, the power of networking and making friends? And people are like, well, oh, actually I have way more friends without, I have more friends now without going to college than I know what to do with because I'm connected in all these platforms. Why am I going to college? What am I paying for when I pay you $60,000 a year? And so they stopped applying to colleges. Same thing with churches, like what am I going to this building? Is it really about the building? We learned the church is not the building. You know, for years I remember as a pastor fighting for the term church, saying church is the people, it's not the building. So stop saying, Let's, I'll meet you at church. Because you are the church, you can't meet at church. Do you remember finding that little tiny battle with people sometimes? Well, during the pandemic, we learned very quickly the church is not the building. Right? It's about something else. So this kind of debunking and deep loading and reckoning uh, was happening. Uh, the reckoning part was happening uh, in our culture with regard to power uh, for years before the church began to experience it more recently. Um, and so there's been a kind of renegotiation renego happening. People have been renegotiating with the church about what the church ought to be. And so these are the four categories that I see uh, where we're sort of like experiencing the paradigm shift in. Uh, the first is uh, with regard to the construct, the model itself. How do we practice Christianity logistically. Is it really going to be as centralized and as hierarchical and as program oriented as it has been? And should it be? 
So that's the first category. The second is with re regard to meaning. People are asking, what is meaningful? It turns out, belonging to a church by way of membership is not as meaningful to people. It turns out that coming to an event and consuming content is not as meaningful to people. Participating in a program is not as meaningful to people. What is meaningful then to people these days? Where are people getting their meaning? If they're not coming to church, where are they getting it? How are they getting it? So that's the second category. Third, with regard to theology, and we're gonna start with this in the next section here, so I don't wanna go too much into this, but people are really questioning what the essentials of the gospel are. They want to know, do I have to buy the whole package or can I buy a la carte? Can we decouple some things, theologically speaking? And we'll get into that. And then the last category of negotiation is with, the, with regard to power or leadership. There's a cultural dimension called power distance, and that describes sort of your cultural uh, sense of respect uh, for power. So in the Asian culture, it's a higher power distance, and so there's more respect paid to authority and positions. And in the Western culture, um, which is the least power distance, they cozy up to their leaders and go, hey buddy, what's going on? That would never happen in an Asian context or a Latino context or an African American context. Higher power distance, right? So uh, we'll talk about that as well. Let me, let me just introduce this passage as we get into the final section here. This is out of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Jesus says this, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. First of all, I want, I want to note that Jesus doesn't say here, he says elsewhere, but here, he doesn't say, I am the light of the world. He says to human beings, you are the light of the world. He doesn't even qualify it and say, because I am in you and I'm shining through you. He doesn't get into all that. He simply says, as far as the world is concerned, you're it. God will be either, either be glorified or cursed based on how you shine your light. Because you, to them, are the light of the world. God is worshipped or glorified or cursed and defamed based on the nature of you as light. That's the responsibility. There's, there are no qualifiers here. This is the reality. You are the light of the world. But he says in verse 16, let your light shine. And what he's saying there is light, by virtue of the fact that it is light, does all of the heavy lifting by itself. You don't have to shine your light. Just let it shine. Letting your light shine and shining your light are two different things. Shining your light is what I think American Christian, Christians have been trying to do. Try to help God. Give Him a hand. Let me exaggerate this testimony for a minute. Let me say it was a miracle. Right? Let me add my touch to it. In fact, he says, get out of the way. Let it do its thing. Shining your light is what happened to me on I-5 the other day when a police officer pulled me over. He shined his light. And it was repelling. It was, it was obnoxious. I didn't like it. It made me anxious. That's exactly how the culture has felt towards Christians for many, many, many years. Christians, well-meaning maybe, 
trying to shine their light. And here Jesus says, let it shine before men in such a way. And this is really the phrase I want us to um, emphasize the most here. What is this way? In such a time as this, what is this way that we are to let our light shine? Because if we do that, what happens? That they may see your good works. I always, I always thought that good works were the light. It's not. Because you know that you could do good works for all sorts of nefarious reasons? I do good works so that I can actually have power over you. So that I can be better than you. So that I can judge you. So I can look down on you. So I can maintain my reputation. So I can manipulate you. I mean, good works can be quite evil. That's not the light. But if you let your light shine in such a way, it illuminates the good works. And the response of the culture is to glorify God who is in heaven. So has the church been letting her light shine in such a way that the world, during the pandemic, has looked to the church and said, oh my goodness, God is alive. We glorify this, your God. Has the, has the culture reacted that way to the church during the pandemic? Has the church let its light shine? Has it been rather obnoxious and rude and self-centered and oblivious and unaware? And just a question. <laughs> okay, last, last section here. Uh, slide 11. So there's four, uh, three, three major ways that I think the future church is going to be different. And this is kind of, I think, uh, if you paid any money, this is what you paid for, I think. The first uh, word I want us to understand is the word essential. We are being called, I believe, to be a church that majors on the majors and minors on the minors to really exposit the gospel and understand what is the pure, essential gospel? Let me prove my case. Next slide, slide 12. This is the last chart I'm gonna show you. This chart shows the race ethnic profile of the US for populations that are 16 and under in the year 2000, 2010, and 2019. And what you probably can see uh, on, on my, this chart is too small for you to read. What it says is that in the year 2019, something really unprecedented happened in the history of the United States of America. What happened? People aged 16 and under became, for the first time, the majority of the United States. I mean, compared to other 16. So 50. 0.05% of all human beings 16 and under were non-white. Latino, black, Asian, and two or more races in that order. That's what this chart is showing. And I don't have the other chart up here, but the rate at which this group, these populations are having kids, way faster, way more than the uh, white population which means the future is here. We have been talking about the diversification of the country for many, many years, and it was always like in the year 2050 or whatever. No, it's 2019. It happened three years ago. Did you know this? These 16-year-olds, how old are they? Now do your math again. It's been how many years have been Three years, so they are, they're adults. They're 19. That's the country, folks. And so this is the unifying theory I've been searching for in my research the last year and a half. I think everything we're seeing, everything we're seeing from the Me Too movement to the Trump phenomenon, to the way people are reacting uh, to mask mandates, 
Everything has to do with this shift that's on the screen right now. It's about a shift in power. Poor against the rich, women against men, the minority against the majority. And in this way, postmodernity is, post is alive and well. Postmodernity, in many ways, was about validating the opinion and the preferences of the majority and raising that to the level that's equal to the majority. That's what postmodernity was in many ways. And what this is saying is the people that we always thought of as a minority, they're actually the majority now. My wife is a school teacher in the district of Bellevue, Washington. She has one white kid in her class. The majority of her class are Indian, some are Chinese, and she has one white kid, and this white kid is not American, he's from a different country. He's an immigrant. Bellevue is the first city in the state of Washington to become the majority, uh, a majority, minority majority city. That happened a few years ago. So, I start with this, and this is sort of the foundational reality we have to grapple with to understand and unlock everything else that we're experiencing. When you are the my, uh, majority, you have the luxuries of being a homogenous group. And when you are homogenous, you have the privilege and the luxury of taking things that are peripheral and making them central. I'm going to give you an example because this was hard for me to uh, grab, grasp. Last night, we were rehearsing all the annual meeting stuff that's going to start later tonight, right? And then afterwards, this big team of 12 people or something, we all went out to dinner. We spent some time trying to decide on a restaurant. We picked this beautiful spot, supposedly, on the water. And then we went, and then we had to sort of stop at the door because they didn't allow minors. And we had one teenager with us. And so we had to pivot. Now, what happens because, what happened because of this one minor? What happened? We suddenly had to figure out what the essentials were for the evening. The peripherals were, we wanted a water view, we wanted, this, we wanted fish and chips. What are some other things? I don't know. But that was sort of what was leading the charge and led us to that restaurant. But as soon as we were hit with the reality of the fact that you know, we were more diverse than we had imagined, we had to pivot and we had to dig deeper into the agendas for the evening. To say, it wasn't about fish and chips. It wasn't about water view. It was about what? Eating. It was about fellowship. It was about celebration, right? That's the essential. Fish and chips was the peripheral. But when we were choosing the restaurant, I'm gonna tell you, it was the essential. <laughs> this is what we were thinking about. As soon as you have a minority in the mix, you have to broaden the way you're thinking and you also have to go deeper, excavate deeper, do a deeper exegetical work to understand. Another example. Jesus did the exact same thing. When he came, one of the beautiful things about his ministry was he immediately and suddenly commanded an incredibly broad spectrum of people. He started calling his disciples followers of him, women. They were not used to this. He also started calling Gentiles into their mix. He also started calling sick people and lepers and prostitutes. Like, what? What is going on? And what did Jesus say? I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. You are mistaking, conflating peripheral for essential. You are taking tradition and conflating it with God's law. Right? And so he says, you think that they are the other because maybe they murdered. Maybe they're murderers. And he said, I tell you, hate in your heart is exactly the same as murder. 
He excavated deeper and made two groups into one. Right? This is, this is now, I believe, the call for the church today. You all have had the luxury to not have to, not, to have not had to think about what really the gospel is. I'll give you some historical examples. There was a, remember there was a joke, this, some of you were here for the ministerium, and we heard a joke about alcohol when we were doing the silent retreat thing, the pastor, David, came up here and said, if you're not drawn to the monastery thing, there is a brewery down the road. And I just was sitting there going, there was a time when we couldn't tell that joke. Because alcohol was an essential. When did alcohol become a peripheral? When did that happen? What year in covenant history did, were you allowed to make jokes about alcohol? Anybody know? Because there was a time when to be a good Swedish Christian, you, sh you weren't supposed to drink alcohol. At least you can joke about it at the annual meeting of all places. <laughs> what about divorce? Yeah. Oh. When, did, when did divorce become peripheral instead of central? Because I remember a time like if you were divorced, you couldn't come to church. You couldn't be a pastor. In the ministry, there were divorcees in the room today, this morning, that I know of. When did that happen? Why did that happen? What do you do when everybody fits the mold, right? And when it's homogenous, you have the luxury to say you have to be this undivorced person to be a pastor in the covenant. But then what if divorced people want to become pastors? You suddenly have to pivot. You have to excavate deeper, right? And then you have to come up with some pearl that explains how it wasn't actually about divorce status or marital status. There was a time when you couldn't be a pastor if you were female in the covenant. When did that happen? Anybody remember covenant history? 60s, 70s, something like that, right? I heard rumors of some huge fight on the floor of the annual meeting and I don't know, I wasn't there. Okay, what about abortion? Was there ever a time when the covenant centralized abortion? Am I making people feel uncomfortable? We, we don't center abortion anymore, right? Because a lot of people have abortions, there's connected to abortions, I mean, it's, it's part of our cultural landscape. And we have found a way to understand it and, go, and work with it. Different people have different views, different political views on this. I've talked to different covenant folks with opposite views about abortion, about divorce, about alcohol. What about enslavement in the country? Do you know for two, three generations, people believed that to be a biblical Christian, you had to support enslavement of black people? And I'm, not, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, but what are some ways that we have decentralized things that were once central? And I think we have to do that again. As our country is diversifying, we have to ask the question, how do we make room? How do we do the centrality of God's word, our first affirmation, and our sixth affirmation, the reality of freedom in Christ? How do we do this? Okay, I want to give you some examples of ways that we uh, have decentralized central things. For example, consumerism. Like, there's a lot of, like, one of the bad, bad, bad things is greed. Isn't that one of the deadly sins? And yet, we never talk about it. We, like, never talk about it. Yeah. Nobody ever says to be a member of this church, you have to stop being such a dang consumer. We want transparency. We want to know everything you're ordering on Amazon. Show us your Amazon wish list and the rate at which things disappear off that wish list. Show us how many cardboard boxes or plastic envelopes show up at your doorstep in any given week. Like, do we ever do that? No, we've, we're completely turning a blind eye to it. What about individualism? I mean, if, do we not see 
how we have idolized individualism in this country during people's reactions to vaccines and mask mandates. Have we not seen this? Do you know that in Asia, like in Japan, for example, you wear a mask not for yourself, That's right. but for the safety of other people. It was never about the rights of the sick, but about caring for those who are still healthy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Like, what happened to that? Isn't that biblical? What about recognizing uh, the stranger, the alien, the widow, and the orphan. Like that's really at the heart, heart, heart of the heart of God. And like the church was divided about it. Do you remember what Peter said to Paul when Paul first became a Christian and he was blessed to go do his missionary thing? What if the, what's the one thing that Paul said they asked him to do? Remember the poor. Remember the poor. Like we never talk about it. It's just like the side thing. It's not a central thing. But for Paul, that was the central thing. And for Peter, that was a central thing. So I'm just saying, like we've been really relativistic and preferential in the way we think about what's central and what's peripheral. It's whatever is convenient. So the question is, what is the gospel then? What is the difference between the gospel and an application or an implication of the gospel. What is the church? I mean, what is the essence? What is the essential church? What should the church really, really, really focus on? And if we really dig deep enough, I think we can make room for all. I think we're supposed to go after the one, forsaking the 99. And a way of doing that in such a way allows us to have all 100. This is part of the responsibility and the opportunity for the church today. To understand for ourselves what in such a way means. And when we understand in such a way, it illuminates the good works and it causes the culture to glorify God who is in heaven instead of blaspheming God. Next slide. Uh, a third uh, implication of all the uh, paradigms that's been shifting for the church is that we are um, being called not to be programmatic, but to be relational once again. One thing that was revealed during the pandemic, not just in maybe your church, but across Christian, American Christianity, was that discipleship has failed. Right? We saw the church revealed, unmasked. And it turned out that people weren't being discipled in churches. Like, how is the church failing so poorly at its one job. You know, Jesus is like, you had one job. <laughs> it's discipleship. Like, that's it. If you, if you had to talk about the function of the church, the job description of the church, it's discipleship. There's like nothing else. That's the whole show, folks. And this was the great lesson of the pandemic, that human beings are fundamentally social. We're meant to be eyeball to eyeball, skin to skin, face to face, shoulder to shoulder. Like, that's what we're supposed to do. That's who we are. And that's what the pandemic reminded us. So the work of the church is about people. And if you want to understand this in a deeper way, Pastor Kurt Nodelhofer, I just read a 60-page treatise on how the church has to be all about people and nothing else. I just, I did read it, Kurt. <laughs> um, so this is the meaning of church. This is what's meaningful. People said nothing else matters. Nothing else is meaningful. Membership doesn't matter. Participating doesn't matter. Consuming doesn't matter. I mean, they don't care about pastor sermons. Why would people settle for your sermon when they can go online and get way better sermons anytime they want? Right? It's not about that. It's about being connected to each other. And so... Uh, we learned during the pandemic that information 
which is the default discipleship model for every church in America, I think, is not actually transformation or formation. Uh, there's a great book called The Other Half of Church that from a neuroscience perspective explains how the church has failed in its understanding of discipleship because they forgot to, uh, they forget that telling people information, like this data dump I'm doing right now, this isn't discipleship. This isn't actually transforming you. It's just information. It's, it's not working. It's not doing anything. But in fact, the book argues that it's even worse because you mistakenly think you've been transformed when you've just been informed. And so you walk away feeling good. Like you had a nutritious meal and all you've done is eat like, I brought up candy bars up here. You're just eating Twix bars and 100 gram bars and thinking you, you had a good meal. All you have is sugar in your blood that goes away and it's gone. Right? So this is what we're learning, that the church has actually been failing in its job. And uh, my research is showing that more than programs, more than this kind of center, central, like centralized, physical like model here that we see, all the chairs pointing to the stage, one-on-one uh, -on -one and one-on-few is the most effective form of disciple making. Life on life, some people call it. So I want to give you um, three, um, three actions for you to do. The first one is attunement. We've been doing church, like the, the people, the professionals who've been putting on church for lay people. We've been doing church so that we can be seen on Sunday. I know, I know this because preachers were complaining to me, it's Peter, it's killing me. I'm preaching to an empty room. You know, they wanted to be seen. This, is, this was the drug. And, and we, we got found out. They, they called us out. We were doing it for our egos. We were doing it so that we have a sense of identity, sense of purpose, sense of meaning, to feel like we're somebody and not the nobody we know ourselves to be. Right? But the job of actually leaders is to see people, not to be seen. To not be the hero, but to be the hero makers. Um, the, first, the first name of God given to God by a human being in the Bible is El Roy, found in Genesis 16, a name given to God by Hagar, who was an invisible nobody. And do you remember who Hagar is? Hagar is the slave woman of Sarai. She was abused by Sarai and abused by Abraham. She, was, she had a child by Abraham and then she was so abused that she decided to run away into the wilderness to commit a double suicide. Because she was nobody and nobody saw her as anything but something that could be discarded and used, used and discarded. So she went there to die and for her child to die and it was there that God revealed himself to her. And I think this was, this was great psychology by God. He appears to her and he sees her. And she says, my eyes have now seen the one who sees me. She names him Elroy, the God who sees me. And you know why this is so special that God names, God's first name is Elroy? Because in developmental psychology we learn that the single most important mechanism that takes place between child and caregiver is what? Attunement, which is seeing the other person. The definition is tracking with the inner subjective reality of the other. When people are seen, it does two things. It creates meaning and builds resilience. It helps to organize the one being seen. It helps to organize their thoughts and feelings. 
And this is what we need for the rest of our lives, for people to see us. We need what's called a secure base to return to, to be seen. And when we are seen, we experience meaning and resilience and our thoughts and feelings get organized. And then we're able to go back out into the world. And then we have to go back to our secure base to be seen again. This is what happens when you go see a spiritual director, when you see a good friend, when you see somebody who loves you. The gift you offer as a friend is to see that person. And so the only way that attunement happens, that El Roy happens, is when we are one-on-one. -on -one. It can't happen one-on-many. -on -many. I'm not seeing you right now. You're not seeing me. I'm performing, and you're passive. Like, there is no way attunement is happening right now. The only way it can happen is one-on-one, -on -one, when you're really sitting down, asking questions, being 110% present, and engaging in the inner subjective reality of the other person. This is the first and primary gift that you offer the world as a follower of Christ. And so the whole show is great. I mean, it's peripheral, but it's not central. The meat of it, the point of it, it really is attunement. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is contradiction. If you study identity development, you learn that the healthiest identity is one that's negotiated. So we present, I present myself as a person, Peter is this, I am that, and then you push back. So you can't be that, because we're having, trying to have a meeting. Calm down, Peter, sit down. And that negotiated identity is the healthy identity that emerges eventually. And so if we are in a, a culture where we have access uh, through technology, the ability to over curate the people that we interact with, we experience something uh, that's really unhealthy. We don't have any kind of contradiction in our lives. I'm going to give you a rather controversial example. This is a secular one. It's going to sound religious, but it's actually uh, secular. I forget the exact numbers, but there's a phenomenon of teenage girls in groups coming out at the same time, simultaneously, uh, as trans. This is a real phenomenon. You can read about this. And the studies show when you follow these girls that the overwhelming majority of them, 90-something percent of them, later will testify, oh, I'm not really trans. That was just something I was going through. But this is, these are secular scientists and helpers in the profession. They say it's, the culture has made it impossible for us to negotiate with these girls in a healthy way because we're not allowed to contradict them at all. Even parents' voices are being shut off. Like if your child comes out and says, you know, daughter comes out and says, I think I'm a boy, a parent can't say no, culturally speaking. And, and the, the secular people are saying, that's not healthy. Because a healthy identity is a negotiated one. You can't just be whatever you want to be, because that assumes you know what you ought to be or even what you are. We have lots of issues and how they present and the little cracks that those issues come through aren't always the truth. And so we need a place where healthy, loving contradiction happens. And that's the second job of the church. In this culture, in a time such as this, your job as a church is to find a way to contradict people. You gotta do that work. You're not here to please people. Tell them. Okay, third thing you have to do uh, is to equip people. We're gonna go into this in the uh, last one called Humble, uh, but I'm gonna start it here. Uh, your job as a church is not to be the superstar for them. You're not a subcontractor. People can't subcontract out their spirituality. Your job is not to be the one who does everything. You know, in psychology we call that overfunctioning. It's unhealthy. 
And it's a kind of narcissism, grandiose or vulnerable, when you overfunction in that manner. Your job is not to do everything for people, but to equip them to bear their own weight, as the Apostle Paul puts it. So uh, these are the uh, three things. Attune, contradict, and equip. And these are the shifts that I think I'm observing. And all, uh, all of these things have to do with the fact that our country is diversifying. Because of the diversifying nature, we really have to get one-on-one -on -one with people, to really meet people where they're at. Because if you do one program, you're going to miss people. Because the country is diverse. It's just how it is. Okay, uh, last section here is slide number 14. And this is uh, in the category of power or leadership. Uh, you are familiar with all of the powerful people that are being knocked off their pedestals, right? The last one that um, I was reading about is Pastor Brian with Hillsong. You heard that he has recently stepped down, but he's just, you know, one of many uh, why do you think that's happening? What do you think is happening? Like, do you perceive that as part of a larger pattern that's happening in the culture? Yeah. Right? Um, so leaders always serve a model. Right? So, for example, if this is a small group, a different skill set is needed. If this was a small group, I shouldn't be holding a microphone doing all of the talking, for example. Or if there is a fire and somebody needs to be very directive, you don't want somebody asking questions and giving choices to people. <laughs> like different situations or different constructs call for different leadership styles. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But what happens when the model is shifting? That means that we need a different kind of leadership. So there's a different definition for what a leader is. So beginning in 2014, this is how far my research took me, there was some kind of shift that happened in 2014, or a shift that was named in the year 2014. Harvard Business Review put out a beautiful little research article on this phenomenon they were observing. They said there was a shift happening in the culture between what they called old power and then what they called new power. Anybody familiar with this? So look this up, Harvard Business Review, old power versus new power. They said old power is like currency, like money. Some have it, some have a lot of it, most people have little of it, some have none of it. There's this sort of disparity, right, in who has power, and that's normal, that's old power. But they were naming a shift in the culture, and they said, you know, what we're seeing emerging is tied to our access to technology, which gives us information and access to resources. Like, for example, if you read the uh, book, The World is Flat, which came out, you know, sometime around that time or a little bit earlier, uh, it talked about how, like, even, like, a middle-income earning person could have a personal assistant in India. Right, because they make a list of to-dos and then they email that over to their assistant in India and they go to bed and they wake up and it's all done. And it costs you like $40 a month or something. It's something really cheap. And so that's the leverage of technology. And what uh, this article was highlighting was that new power not, is not like currency, but it's more like a current. So there are many, 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 many streams. So many people have a little bit of power, but when, the, when all these people begin to come together, like a current, it can surge. And it becomes more powerful than any one river. And we saw that facilitated by technology. These movements, all these hashtag movements and whatnot. This is all representing new power. Right? Uh, in 2016, uh, so two years after the HBR article came out, uh, researchers in the field of leadership began to notice a phenomenon in corporations across America. They began to notice 
uh, an un unprecedented interest, an interest in a new style of leadership that they called humble leadership. It seemed to them like every other person wanted to understand what humble leadership was. And alongside that, or underneath that, there was this other uh, leadership style that was really becoming more and more popular, something called emotional intelligence. And you guys all know about it. Emotional intelligence can be understood as a leader who is, uh, a, a, an emotionally intelligent leader is a leader who is uh, aware of their own mind, their own mind state, their emotional state, and then, based on that awareness, regulates him or herself. And simultaneously using that awareness, they're able to tune in to the mind states of the people around them, their followers, and then using that awareness help regulate the group on an emotional level. That is to say, on a relational level. They understand how they are and how they're being experienced by other people. So they are constantly leading with that kind of relationality, or if you will, a humility, because it's a respect for other people. They don't have the luxury to just be oblivious to other people. How other people are experiencing them matters to them. So it's a kind of relationality and humility. And we're beginning to see that the pandemic has accelerated uh, this leadership style, this humble leadership style this emotionally attuned leadership style, because the pandemic uh, forced a more decentralized, less hierarchical approach to being the church. And as the culture was moving in this way, people that are members of the church began to lose their uh, sort of taste for powerful narcissistic leaders. And these leaders began to be called out Books like Chuck DeGroat's uh, When Narcissism Comes to the Church became more commonly read uh, by leaders and by uh, churches. And so the rock star, heavy-handed, dictatorial church planter, for example, is just not as attractive even in the Department of Start and Strength in Churches. We used to really be drawn to that type of leader. Man, this person, we used to call it the gathering gift. And now it just feels a little bit gross. Do <laughs> you know what idolatry is? Idolatry by definition is when you mistaken divinity with the thing that this, you know, when you mistaken divinity to be attached to the thing itself. And there was a kind of like idolatry that was part of the church planting strategy. You know, you come and feel this attraction, this sort of compulsion to, like, I mean, like, this is amazing. Like, my wife and I recently visited this church plant in Bellevue, this Indian American uh, co-planting couple, right? They're doing really, really well. They just bought a brand, like, they just outright bought a new building in Bellevue, not cheap. This is just a five-year-old church plant. And you know what my wife and I talked about all Sunday after we came home from church? The pastor. Like we were just really curious about like what they were like at home, what their marriage was like, what foods they like, and how they raised their kids. And it's like, why were we so interested in the pastor? Like what, what happened when we visited their church like one time? Like that's the idol fact making factory that my heart is. You know what I mean? Like I'm beginning to uh, like confuse divinity with the pastor. Like God and the pastor, it just kind of feels a little bit like one and the same. I don't know how that happened. Like I'm in the business, I should be immune to that. But I fell for it. I was under the spell as well. Like that's a little bit sick. And we have a kind of a reaction to that. And uh, you know, one of the core emotions that we have in our brainstem here is the emotion called disgust. And collectively as a society, we're beginning to experience a bit of a, have a disgust reaction to narcissistic leadership. Right, it's a little cringy when we see it in action. 
So uh, what I'm seeing is that there's a kind of reckoning with power that's happening. The power distance is closing a little bit, and we're not as believing of whatever the leader says anymore. We have access to the same information. People are Googling me in real time right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, we see this in scripture already. We see that Jesus differentiated earthly leadership from God's vision for the church. He says, for example, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Like, did we miss this? Did we forget Jesus said this? But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. That's Mark chapter 10. I think the church became enamored with the corporate world. And we forgot that the corporation is not the church. Like, it's okay for power to be concentrated in the corporate world. That's what Jesus says. It's the way it is in the Gentile world. And, you know, translation meaning outside the church. It's okay. That's normal and natural. That's the way power works. But not so among you. This phrase, among you, is in reference to the church. Like in the church, we're not supposed to understand nor practice power in the same way. The Gentiles lord it over each other but not so among you. And then the Apostle Paul explains what Jesus meant by this when he gives us the APEST model. He says, if you want to be a leader in the church, I want to give you a job description. And here's how we will know that you are succeeding in this job description. Your job is not to be the one who does all the ministry. Your job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Like that's your job description. That's it. And the way we will know you are doing this is the fruit of your ministry are other disciples who are being equipped by you. That's it. Like not attendance, not giving. You know what I'm saying? But that model raised up a certain kind of leader. But the model is now changing, so even the description of what a leader is is beginning to shift. And so church planting folks and I were having this conversation. How is the profile of the ideal church planter changing today? Do we want somebody with a quote-unquote gathering gift? And if they have a gathering gift, what do we mean by gathering gift? Now what we mean more than ever is, they are capable of equipping the lay body for the work of the ministry and raising up other people who are also equippers. It's about disciple making, not about doing the ministry yourself. Pastors that I talk to, they kind of universally um, are caught in a conundrum between the baker and the bakery. The reason they went into the bakery business is because they love bread, and they love baking bread. Their passion is bread. But as soon as they went into the bakery business, in order to make bread full time, they realized they never get to bake bread anymore, because now they have to run the stinking bakery. The tyranny of the bakery was always at their door. They had to take care of employees, deal with the city, pay rent, maintain equipment. Never ever get to bake bread anymore. Peter, what happened? I got into this to bake bread. I love bread. I never get to bake bread anymore. Do you, do you get to teach other people to bake bread? No, never. All I do is run the shop. Right? So we got this uh, humble leadership that's emerging. And I think this new model is gonna allow us to be more the church than ever before, to really emphasize disciples making disciples. That's the opportunity. That's what I think repentance looks like. 
It also means that we have to rethink all of the a bloat around the old model that we still have, including the way we use money. Like if you look at uh, church budget, I think it's normal for like 70 or 75% of the church budget to go towards like, you know, human resources. That's a lot of professionals just doing the ministry, running the programs, but not actually making disciples. The phrase I want to end on is, in such a way, slide 15. Uh, this is your job now. If you're taking away anything from this, this is it. Just go and learn what this way is for you in your church. I want to give you one example and then we will end here. Um, there is a um, beautiful little 12-page letter written by a Christian apologist from the first century church to a Roman officer named Diognetus, and you can Google this, I know you will. Um, but this Roman officer was really curious about the so-called followers of the way. Right? And he said, I don't understand Christians, because Romans, we are like the first race. You know, everything, all roads lead to Rome. Everything exists for the sake of Rome. Right? Kind of like amalgamous, like pluralists. You can do whatever you want, live any way you want, as long as all roads lead to consumerism, it's okay. It keeps the economy going. The, the second way, or the second race, were the Jews. They were the isolationists who had a subculture. They had a peculiar way of existing, and everybody knew who they were. They lived in their subdomain. And they were non-threatening because they were easily identifiable. As long as they were left alone, they left us alone. And they lived peacefully, uh, kind of out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. But then Christians emerged, and Christians were threatening to the Romans because they were invisible, because they looked just like Romans, they lived just like Romans. They married and had jobs and, and sought the welfare of the city the way God commanded uh, the Jews in exile to do. And yet, they maintained certain distinctives. And so Dionysus was uh, curious and asked this Christian to explain this third race to them to him. And so uh, this Christian wrote this letter, 12-page letter to Diognetus, Diognetus, and this is a portion of that letter. If you go to that last slide, this is sorry about the wall of text. I'll read it for you here. This is what he says. For the Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country, nor language, nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a peculiar form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. Meaning they didn't have their own Christian subculture or Christian t-shirts. They didn't speak Christianese in church and have this peculiar way of being. They looked, walked, and talked just like Romans. Okay, you got that? The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines. They forsook the non-essentials, folks. This is what is being said. They didn't do the peripheral, central confusion thing here. They only clung to what was essential. They marry as do all others. They beget children, and here are some of the distinctives. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring, which was common practice infanticide was. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They were not consumeristic. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They were not entitled. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They would have worn masks. <laughs> they love all men and are pers persecuted by all instead of demanding their rights. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil spoken of and yet are justified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good, 
yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks, yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. So the first century church, this is how they defined, quote unquote, in such a way. I don't think the centralized church model is going away, but I do think it's going to be decentered. I think the show is not going to be about Sunday. Sunday is going to be a way to celebrate the disciple making that's happening outside of Sunday. And I think that Christian leaders are not going to be the rock stars anymore, but they really are going to be the equippers of the saints for the work of the ministry, which the lay body has been called to do. I think this is the shift we're going to see. So that's my presentation. Uh, I am working on a book, trying to write 180 pages on all this stuff and more. There's more categories I left out. So if you want to talk to me about it, talk to me after August, and I hope it'll be done. But right now, I have no answers. <laughs> Can I close us in prayer? God, thank you for this revival that I think you're bringing to the church here in America. Thank you for showing us some of the ugliness of the church that was hidden. Thank you for uh, giving us a redemptive uh, hope for ourselves as Christians and for the church which you died for, which we belong to, which we love. God, help us to let our light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.